All right, so I see some folks in the audience I've worked with in the past, and so I just want to um, be clear up front. I'm going to take credit for everybody's work and make it seem like I did all the right things. Um, so this is a, it's a talk about stepping stones um, and not milestones. Very buzzwordy, but I'll try to make this pretty, pretty actual straightforward and not, and not, um, not kind of um, vague. Um, so I want to start with the mythology of the perfect project, which, by the way, is something that doesn't exist. Um, but I've been fortunate enough to work on some very large projects, uh, things like, um, like Sarah just mentioned, like building the kind of multi-exabyte distributed storage system at Dropbox. This is a system of about a million hard drives and moving the company off AWS uh, S3. I think that was the largest ever data migration in history. Um, stuff like um, my, uh, multi-homing the company um, so that you know, we can shut down the entire West Coast in the middle of the day and have the, the company keep running seamlessly with no downtime. Um, and these are, these are products that had just like, at a certain point, zero room for error. You know, once you have multi hundred million dollars invested in projects and, and if they go wrong, it's kind of the end of the, of the company. Uh, these are products that have, have to go well. Um, and so it's tempting to, to celebrate these products and say, um, you know, these are, these are great products to look at as examples, but I think they're actually terrible role models. Um, because how these products look from afar is very different from how they actually worked, um, because they appeared very high risk. Um, and it appeared like we knew what we were doing, and we absolutely did not know what we were doing. Right? And I think um, there's a lot of lessons I've seen engineers take from these products that I think are real anti-lessons. Um, and one of the conclusions is the team were like these geniuses that sat down and planned out this perfect trajectory and foresaw all these corner cases and delivered on these multi-year projects that just kind of looked like they delivered on the dime and everything was perfect. And that is very discouraging because it's impossible and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's useless because it, you, know, you can't do it. And the other thing sometimes I see is they say, maybe there's some nepotism going on. Why does this team get to do this big risky project that I don't? Right? Um, isn't this a big cavalier project? And that's also not very instructive um, because it's missing the point. And so these faulty observations can lead to, to two failure modes that I've seen happen quite a lot. And one is the never-ending plan. And I'm not going to give concrete examples for these two because I don't want to trash talk anyone's projects, but you've probably seen this happen before. And the never-ending plan is a team of engineers that sit there and spend their whole life in design documents. Right? They're iterating over and over again in design docs. Everyone becomes a world expert, shutting people's ideas down, um, debating every detail, um, which, by the way, is not at all fun and is totally discouraging. And if his teams ever get anything done, you'll find that progress, um, early progress, kind of starts to slow down. Right? People get less and less done because they're always worrying, am I doing the right thing? And they're probably not doing the right thing. It's very hard to be doing the right thing in a complex project. Because right? you're trying to be perfect in a domain where perfection is impossible. And the second failure mode is this confident road to nowhere. Right? This is the team that's like, just trust us, we got this. Like, just let us do this thing. And you'll recognize this team because they, they like to think that everyone else is an idiot. Right? That team, they, they're idiots, they don't get it. Right? Or management, management have no idea what's going on. Right? And they have a kind of acrimonious relationship with everybody else. Um, but the project just plows ahead Every other team gets stalled, they all get pissed off, and eventually their product gets shut down um, with nothing to show for it. These are both disasters, and I, I try to think, of why do these happen? Because I like to think that engineers are smart, well-intentioned people. So why do smart, well-intentioned people approach products in ways that don't make sense? And I think it's because of a natural extension of how we operate as engineers, right? We're allergic to uncertainty. We like kind of doing things perfectly. We like math. We like you know, accurate results, and we like being evaluated, and we like getting a gold star and being patted on the head. And this is kind of how things operate when you're a junior engineer. You get a task, and you nail it, and someone says you're awesome. Right? But as a senior engineer, this is very different to how things work. Um, as a senior engineer, you have to deal with the concept of uncertainty. Um, and there's a shift, not just in the magnitude of how you work, because actually you probably become worse at programming when you get more senior, but there's a shift in the nature of how you work. You do different kinds of work, and you do work that involves uncertainty. And it's one of the most difficult concepts for an engineer to get comfortable with. So this is a quote about unknown unknowns, and it sounds like a tongue twister. It sounds very silly, and it's by Donald Rumsfeld. So just ignore the context, but it's a very important quote, and I'm going to read it out. Right? It says, as we know, there are known knowns. They're the things that we know we know. We also know there are un known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, 
the ones we don't know, we don't know. Right? And I remember this quote. I remember everyone laughing at it. You know, the context was weird, right? Um, but I think this is really important to know when you think about engineering, right? So what's a known known? Just something you got to do. Uh, I've got to implement an API for login. Uh, and just go do it. Put it on the task list. That's a known known. What's a known unknown? I don't know. We have to pick an auth provider. We have to find a database. We have to sort out how we're going to store that thing, right? We don't know how we're going to do it, but we know that problem is going to happen. We're going to run into it. But the thing that characterizes difficult engineering projects is unknown unknowns. It's the stuff you don't know in advance that you don't know. It's discovering that the big cluster of SSDs you uh, deployed to be a right ahead cache um, is failing because you didn't think through the right cycles properly and it's all falling apart. Or you have to re-architect your data center topology because of you know, congestion. Or you know, a new competitor shows up and you have to pivot. Right? These are the things you don't see coming and this is what um, really typifies engineering projects. And critically, you can't think your way through finding unknown unknowns. You can't sit down and stare at a blank piece of paper and argue in a document and surface these things. You have to go find them. Right? So let's talk about how product management usually works. We've probably all seen um, these projects with milestones M1, M2A, M2B, and M3. Right? And I guess these are kind of somewhat useful for tracking progress. But otherwise, they're relatively useless because they don't teach us anything. Right? So they're not motivating. No one gets excited about shipping milestone M2A. There's no big, wow, we shipped M2A. Awesome. Right? Um, and they generally don't deliver concrete business value. Right? If we get to M2B, can we stop and call the product a success? Probably not. Right? And they don't teach us anything. So M1 doesn't really teach us much about what we need to do for M2A. Right? So how can we do better? So this is a diagram of what engineers want the world to look like. You have a starting point, you have an end goal, you plan out a bunch of tasks along the way, you do them in order, and then you ship the project and we all get promoted, right? I don't think I've ever seen this happen in any interesting project, right? It happens in easy projects, but you know, who cares, right? Um, this is how the real world works, and this is very managerial and buzzwordy because it says the cone of strategy on this, right? But uh, I'll ask you to take a look at this diagram, right? So what's different about this? So, End goals is a big, vague cloud of things we might do. Generally, you don't know what the end goal is going to be. There could be a couple of end goals, right? The end goal might be, I don't know, build a storage system or write a distributed database or, or um, have a successful logging platform or build an, ex an exception uh, tracking company, right? You don't know exactly what that's going to look like in advance. Um, you have a starting point, um, and you have a set of steps along the way, but it's a meandering path towards success, right? Each step has to be roughly directionally aligned with the strategy, but you're going to change direction each step along the way. And the real key here is when you get to a certain point in this trajectory, the world changes. And this sounds ridiculous to say, but your brain changes. When you've delivered an incremental solution to a problem, there was a thousand options in your head at the start, and now there's 17 options for next steps. And everything seems much more tractable psychologically. So I'm calling the points in this diagram stepping stones. It's my buzzword of the day. It sounds a bit gratuitous. But the point here is that a stepping stone is a vantage point. Right? Stepping stone is a point where unknown unknowns are surfaced and eliminated, and progress uh, improves, and your mental model clarifies, um, and everything feels more tractable. So let's define a stepping stone more concretely. So stepping stones are a concrete, cohesive deliverable. They involve shipping something, delivering something, right? Um, it might be a system that works on a single node instead of a cluster. It might be a database that's entirely in memory, right? Um, it might be something that works as long as nothing fails, right? Um, it should deliver real incremental value, right? So if this company decides to pull the plug on the project and all you're left is with is the stepping stones, they should be worth something. Um, one example for building the story system at Dropbox was um, everyone was telling me um, when Amazon built S3, they used this big distributed data structure called a Patricia try. And you absolutely knew this need to build this custom distributed data structure indexing to the story system. And we were like, well, why don't we just use MySQL and see what happens? Right? And guess what? We never changed it. It's still running on MySQL, the index. Right? So it's a simplified version that is, is legitimate in its own, um, own right. 
a stepping stone should exist within the cone of strategy. Right? I see Andrew Fong already laughing at me, but it's got to it's got to exist in this cone. It should be directionally aligned. What does that mean? Well, um, if you spend a bunch of time building a cluster management system and then just move everything to AWS Lambda, I think you stepped in the wrong direction. You built something useless, right? That wasn't directionally aligned. But if you build a prototype in Python first, and then you're like, cool, I think this works, I think the API is pretty good, let's rewrite it in Rust or Go, that feels directionally aligned to me, right? It should be a step towards the goal. And importantly, stepping stones should cover unknown unknowns. They should allow us to learn something. So we could build a basic prototype to see if other teams can use our APIs or if customers like it. We could build a non-scalable solution first and then see where it breaks and then optimize the things that, 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 that do. Right? We can build a single-threaded version of some code and, and, and see if down, downstream services can handle the load. So by building um, smaller incremental deliverables, right, it uncovers unexpected outcomes along the way and allows us to clarify this mental model. Personally, I find, and I'm guessing you find this too, this is a limit to how many problems I can keep in my head at one period of time. There's like, there's like two different types of things in your head. There's like the working set of all these worries that are floating around, and every now and then you take seven of those worries and compress them down to one little solution, and then all of a sudden you've got more space inside your head. Right? I think this is the only way that you can handle these big projects. So, what can we actually do with stepping stones? I'm going to give some examples of, that are hopefully relevant. So the first one is this, is this issue of pressure from management. This is a VP breathing down your neck and saying, um, you know, why isn't this product shipping? Um, why do you need more resources? By the way, resources means people, by the way. I don't know if you know, it's a, it's a code word. Um, and oftentimes I see engineers getting annoyed about this and thinking management are idiots, right? But you've got to put yourself in their head. They have accountability too. They have responsibilities too. They've got to deliver to the company. Right? So instead of um, you know, telling everyone to like, hold their breath and cross their fingers, just scope the project into a set of stepping stones. Right? Convince the company that you're going to deliver incremental value along the way. And if you don't deliver on the final, you know, the final outcome, at least you'll have something partial done and show them that, there's, that you know, there'll be ability along the way to evaluate proce uh, progress. Um, there's a lot of examples I can give. There's one example uh, was multi-homing Dropbox. Um, which is a product that had failed twice, at least, beforehand. Um, and so we wanted to do it a third time and say we're actually going to do this project. And we didn't go to the company and say, you know, give us all this money and distract the entire engineering team and just trust us. Right? We broke this product down into a set of incremental deliverables that gave confidence. Right? So the first one was rewriting service discovery, so it was agnostic to region. Right? And then we um, decoupled services that you know, had synchronous requests between them. And then we um, changed how database replication worked, and we added consistent caching. And there was all these deliverables on the way that actually advanced the company, but also stepped us towards an actual solution that we needed to get to. A web of dependencies, you've seen this before, it's an increasingly complex set of other teams that depend on this product to ship before their work can get done. I've been on the receiving end of this, it sucks when you're the tech lead of a team, you're trying to get something done and every day there's another tech lead or another PM breathing down your neck about needing to do this dependency for them, right? So the obvious solution generally here is just to build the API first, right? If someone needs um, some implementation, just say you're doing a big rewrite and you need to change the API, just do the API first, right? And fake it on the back end. Unblock them, right? And then go and do it properly. Gen oftentimes you can find this works. Um, or the classic case of an engineer that wants to over-optimize. Or this maybe is you. Maybe you have a, a devil on your shoulder trying to get you to over-optimize. And there's countless times I've had someone tell me we absolutely have to build this like lock-free concurrent data structure uh, in assembly code or we, there's no way we can do this project, right? And it's very hard to tell someone no because I don't actually know if they're wrong. Maybe we do need to do this thing. Maybe we need to build this advanced data structure, right? But what I can tell that person is, hey, why don't we just do that later, right? Why don't we do the basic thing first? There's so many examples at Convex where we just ship something really simple that uses like an N squared algorithm or just use, stores data in a, in a hash table, you know, and later on we can add the optimization when we need to, right? Um, oftentimes you'll find that you'll never need the optimization at all, and if you do, at least you've learned why you need it along the way, right? Um, 
Optimizing early on is almost always a bad idea. Um, or time to cut and run. Right? Has the product run its course? Are we running out of resources? That word again. Do people need to go work on other things? Have priorities shifted at the company? You better hope you have some incremental progress. Because almost all products I've seen have never really finished. It's very rare you see a product actually finish in terms of like you write this big plan of what you want to do and at the end all that stuff is done. Right? Generally you stop like three quarters of the way in and you say it's good enough. Right? Let's go focus on something else. Right? And so you better hope you structure that product in such a way that you know, 18 months in you've got something to show for it. Because I have seen the contrary many times of teams that spend two years, we kill the product and there's nothing left. And that's really sad. Or what if a team's struggling to be motivated, or you're struggling to be motivated? This happens to me a lot, right? Sometimes if I'm working on a, like a long product and I see no uh, progress in sight, I slow down, I don't feel like coming to work, I don't really know what's going on inside my head, but I'm like, well, well I feel grumpy right now, right? And oftentimes this is just because you're not shipping stuff, you haven't got that serotonin rush of actually delivering anything, right? Um, so you've got to break products down into, into like bite-sized chunks that actually deliver something. So, I have a startup right now. We have a great platform. It's convex.dev. You should go use it. It'll solve all your problems. But um, we have a lot more features we need to build. Right? And if I told all the employees to hold their breath and while we build a distributed database, et cetera, et cetera, they're going to be really unhappy and we're going to learn nothing. But instead, we ship a new feature basically every week. And sometimes, instead of shipping a feature, we just put out some docs on how to solve that problem with a third party. Right? Hey, just use Amazon uh, S3 for your blob storage, and this is how to do it with Convex, right? And that sometimes just solves the problem, right? But that means we can put stuff out there, even if we solve it in a hacky way, get customer feedback, and it feels good. It feels really exciting to have people using your stuff. It doesn't feel good at all to hit an arbitrary milestone. It feels awesome when someone's on Discord saying they're using your stuff. Uh, and lastly, what if you don't know what you're doing? Because you probably don't. I don't know what I'm doing, right? Um, you know, there's examples in like this Dropbox story system where we use this custom designed Vandermon matrix for erasure coding that took into consideration like the network bandwidth and the cost of the network cards and the cost of hard drives and optimized these for reconstruction. And it was really advanced stuff. And I can promise you we weren't thinking about linear algebra when we first started the project, right? We just build the basic thing that just replicated data inefficiently and worry about this way later on. So this is, don't be ashamed of doing the simple thing. This is just how projects work. No one knows in advance. But there's a dark side of stepping stones. I just want to acknowledge, right? You could waste time building useless stuff, right? If, if it's going to take you a week to do it, just do the damn thing. Don't break it down into stepping stones, right? These are not stepping pebbles or stepping sand, right? Just go do something and stop talking about it, right? This is for long-term things, right? Um, you don't need three JIRA tasks for a project that's going to take you one afternoon, right? Um, so don't be timid, don't just go through the motions on this stuff, be, just, you know, be actual intentional. Uh, you can get stuck in a local maxima. Sometimes, very occasionally, you have to take a big risk and just make some big massive change. This is usually when like, a big system rewrite happens. Someone says, hey, we're going to rewrite this whole thing from scratch. And mostly that doesn't work, mostly those products fail. But sometimes you've got to do it. And, but when you do it, you've got to accept the risk. Generally, you see this happen at big companies like Google where they just have a lot of engineers and they can afford to waste some engineering time. Right? You, then you have multiple groups doing the same thing and maybe one will succeed, who cares? Um, and it's not an excuse to move without thinking. Right? This is not like just plow blindly ahead and do some things. You've got to think about the stepping stones as a flow. Right? What things are you going to deliver in order? What do we think we're going to learn about them, about the system as we go? Right? Be very intentional, but be open-minded along the way. Right? Um, the last point I want to make here is the essence of stepping stones is that you're going to change direction slightly as you go. And if you overcomplicate things and you build sophisticated systems, you will not be able to do that. Right? The essence of good systems design is, is simplicity. It's a very big topic. It's very hard to describe in one slide. Right? But do everything you can to write as little code as possible. Have the cleanest APIs as possible. Use as many third-party systems as you can. Right? Um, solve as few problems as you possibly can, because you, if you over-deliver early in a project, you will never be able to change direction, and you end up building the wrong thing. So that's stepping stones. It's a simple idea. It's one thing that's helped me a lot in the projects that I've worked on. So embrace uncertainty. Structure projects around uncovering 
unknown unknowns and develop an ability to break big projects down into independently valuable and independently valuable stepping stones. There we go. Thank you. So if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and we're also asking on Discord. So if you're on Discord, please feel free to ask questions. I am ready to read them. Um, James, thank you so much. No I, you know, as if we planned it, I think that you <laughs> reiterated a lot of the things that was said in, for example, the WTF panel about simplicity and making sure that you're making decisions for the site that you can see, knowing that there might need to be changes in the future. I was just having conversations before this talk about the exact same topic, so I was like, awesome. <laughs> exactly. I know the in the back, though. Beautiful, beautiful. So if we can get a mic over towards the back. Um, I was going to do a quick update, too, if the mic's not. There we go. Okay. Mic is there. So how do you measure simplicity so you know you're not building something complex? Yeah, I've got a whole talk where I complain about data-driven decision-making. Uh, and why I do that is because if everything is data-driven, you're implicitly devaluing the immeasurable, right? So if you focus on just like lines, if I gave you a formula based on lines of code, you would devalue the immeasurable stuff. And the immeasurable thing is just how do you feel about it, right? And um, this is happening Convex, my company, right? Our initial marketing message it was a little bit too sophisticated, a little bit too complicated. It was quite hard to understand because the shape it inhabited in people's minds was, it wasn't convex, right? It was a little bit too complicated, right? So this is really hand wavy, but it has to occupy a very simple shape in your head, right? And this is, so simple APIs tend to have short names for function signatures, right? Um, they tend to be, the functions are named as verbs, right? The system's design thinking about states, which are nouns. There's a lot of things that go into simplicity, but it has to be about things should not have corner cases, there shouldn't be side effects, it should be very clean abstractions, and you should be able to understand every API or every um, library call with like one sentence of explanation for what happens and not a, not a paragraph. The point on the immeasurable, like how you feel, I think that uh, it was Divya that brought that up a little bit in the in the panel of like, you might have chosen some set of frameworks or tool set for your team, but if all of the engineers are doing something else, like it's not something that you can necessarily just measure with data. Like yeah, you said. I mean, I've had um, debates before about what um, distributed database to choose for a company, right? And people arguing what we should do is just try six of them and see which has the highest throughput or the lowest latency. This is not how you make a decision like that. Yeah. It's a multivariate decision that involves a lot of factors, right? And you're selling yourself short by just trying to focus on the, the real basic stuff and not the complex stuff, right? Use your, the, the wholeness and the fullness of your mental capacities to make this, and your taste and your gut to make these decisions. Yeah, yeah that's true. And be okay with remaking, making new decisions. Yeah, take a risk and fail. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. I, um, awesome talk, by the way, thank, thank you. you. Um, so I'm just curious if you've kind of used, like, outcomes as like as part of this process because that's something that I'm working on with the teams that I lead to kind of really think through okay here are our milestones and here are the outcomes so this is when we know we've successfully reached this milestone right yeah. so I mean, how is that kind of part of this loop that you've been describing I mean I, I agree and the way I would, I would frame it is like what's the point right like like if we do something what's the point of doing it unless there's an outcome you know so it's like what does this thing have value or does it not have value, right? Like, oh, hey, I refactored this system. What do we get out of this? Is it easy to use? Is it like, is it faster? Is it this or that? And that's the outcome, right? So when you're defining the, va the value of a deliverable, it should be defined in the, in, the, in the form of the value or the outcome to the organization. We're doing this because it's easier to use. We're doing this because it's faster. We're doing this because it's more reliable. Not doing this because, hey, it was fun to build, right? Or it was a cool engineering project. Last question. Oh, oh, hang on. oh, sorry, Eli first, go ahead, and then we'll do you. <laughs> How do you know you're in a local maxima? Say it again? How do you know you're in a local maxima? How do you know you're in a local maxima, right? So you can, if you get too incremental on this stuff, you will just end up doing like two modest things. If you go too safe, you're gonna end up doing boring stuff and you're not gonna innovate, right? So you have to give yourself the freedom to take some risks every now and then, right? Um, how I feel is if you keep everything else simple, right, mm -hmm. there's room to take a risk, 
right? If you understand your system's reliable, there's room to add this new crazy feature. Um, and it's a longer answer. I think if you're a tech lead, you need to keep space in your, like, and not take on so many projects such that you don't have a few hours a week to sit down and think, why, why are we here? What the hell are we doing? Is this good enough? Like, um, and you have to kind of pressure test what you've done, what you're doing now versus why we even exist. Um, it's really easy to, to it's really easy to tunnel vision your way into just going through the motions. Mm. And so, yeah, again, it's a gut feel, but I think it's almost every now and then you make a thought experiment. Every now and then you say, if we hadn't done any of these things right now, if we had none of these constraints, if it was a perfect world with the infinite resources, what would we do? And then you just, just compare what would the infinite team with a million people and you know, a bajillion dollars do compared to what we're doing now and use that as a, as a metric to see how we, you know, how we make good decisions. Yeah. In the planning phase of a large project, what frameworks or um, techniques do you use to like, fully digest known knowns, known unknowns, without being stuck in like, analysis paralysis? Yeah, so you cannot surface unknown unknowns. Um, and so I think about it in terms of macro deliverables that have some value and some path to get there, right? But accept and keep buffer in there that we're gonna screw it up along the way, right? Um, this is not quite an answer to your question, right? So you might say, cool, um, if we're just like um, ignoring the unknown unknowns, aren't we gonna take longer to do projects where we have to add buffer into every step for, to, to shape, change direction? My experience is that's not the case because my experience is people do way more work on projects that look like this. Like, because engineering output is so malleable. There's at least a 10x difference in output between a motivated team and an unmotivated team. And um, you know, I, when doing some of this work, I was doing 16 hour days just because I wanted to. That's not a good idea, right? Um, and so I, I think you've got to add, just add that buffer. You just, you got to use your gut, you know, come up with the outcomes, um, and then just trust that if each step is exciting enough and concrete enough, that people will just throw down and, and make sure the product actually delivers basically as fast as if you just charted it. If you, if you had, I guess my point is, if you know, if you were an oracle and you knew everything on the way and you tried to go a straight line path to success, I'm gonna bet you go faster doing it instead of stepping stones just because it's more fun. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you, James. All right, thank you.